Do you know what time it is? It's Supernatural Story Time. And if you're easily scared, and even if you're not, there's only one thing left to do. Just turn off the lights, because these are stories that you listen to only oh, 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 in the in dark. dark. The devil is in the details. My wife and I were at a charity event, one of those balls where everyone dresses up and donates items that are auctioned off for charity. These events tend to attract a lot of wealthy people as the items are expensive luxury items donated to the ball. People pretend to do a lot of good at these events, but to be honest, from my experience, it's just an excuse for really rich bastards to show off their new trophy wife and play dress up. My wife and I tend to attend these events on behalf of my firm. I'm kind of the public face of our group and my wife does like to play dress up. I was given a max charity budget of $50,000 to spend at the ball in the company's name, which seems like a lot of money. However, this event draws high rollers who spend millions for the charity, bidding on items that range from jerseys worn by famous football players to 10 carat diamonds. To be honest, I couldn't tell you at all where the actual charity money goes. All I know is that the ball has become one of the world's largest networking events. Wealthy people from all around the world attend the ball, which, by the way, tickets start at $5,000 per person. As such, people in all kinds of fields show up in the hopes of attracting business from other rich people. Our firm specializes in international trade, as it were, so naturally this kind of ball was ideal for drumming up business for our firm. So there we were, walking around looking at the items to bid on, making silent bids. One of my wife and my favorite things to do at this event is to find the most popular item and place the second or third silent bid, knowing that someone is very likely to outbid us. But those people will see our names on the bid sheet and hopefully seek us out later. For those that have never been to these charity auctions, I'll give you a brief rundown. The beginning of the evening starts with drinks and a cocktail hour where items are lined up and have a sheet of paper describing the item and what the minimum bid is followed by a series of blanks next to a dollar amount. You are given a sheet of stickers with your auction ID on them and you place a sticker next to what you are willing to bid for the item. You check back periodically to see if you have been outbid and if you have, you can place another sticker at a higher dollar amount. Then drinks are followed by dinner and more drinks at a table where you are randomly matched with people, unless you sponsor the table. Then you get a whole table for your guests. You make small talk with your table mates before the live auction starts. This is where the big money spends and the items are the most expensive and rare ones being auctioned that evening. Towards the end of the evening, the auctioneer will announce that the silent auction is about to end and to check your bids. Finally, after the close of all the auctions, winning bidders collect their items and go home. Okay, so back to the start of this nightmare. We were at the ball and my wife and I were seated at this table with eight others. We knew two of the people at the table, but made small talk with the others. That's where we met Oliva. Oliva was the trophy wife of Hank. Hank and Oliva owned a real estate company. Hank focused on commercial real estate, but Oliva sold residential properties. My wife mentioned that we were looking to buy a new house soon, just making small talk, but asked about whether we should buy in the city or a small area just outside the city called Pleasantville. Oliva looked at us with this snobbish attitude and said, Pleasantville? Are you sure you can afford to buy in Pleasantville? It is awfully expensive. Don't get me wrong. We were not dressed like slobs. But you could tell we were not the 1% of the 1% that showed up that night. My wife just smiled and started talking to the other couples. Then came the live auction. This is another fun part where my wife and I like to really get in on the action. We tend to bid on nearly everything. Usually the price flies way past our max budget, but it draws some attention, sparks some conversation after the event, and we usually end up making a business connection and or a friend after that. First came a pair of shoes worn by Michael Jordan. We'll start the bidding at $10,000, folks, the auctioneer shouts. We flash our number $10,000. 
Ice cream. We got our first bid. Can I get 11, folks? 11, anyone? $11,000. Come on. I started to get nervous. I really didn't want to own a pair of MJ's shoes, but, well, 11. I heard that with a sigh of relief. Oliva looked over with that look like, oh, shit, are these people actually rich? She seemed to be thinking, you've got to be rich if you're going to blow 10 grand on some used shoes. The auction continued. There were some gloves worn by Mike Tyson, a few paintings by famous people, a jaguar driven in a Bond film, and then there was this bronze statue of Ares, the god of war. Our firm was doing such business with a few Greek firms, and I thought it might be a conversation starter with those guys and didn't think the company would mind. The bidding started. A few interested buyers chimed in, and the price shot up quickly. 25000 32000 40000 Then bidding slowed. 40000 going once. Come on. I know there has to be more interest. You, sir, you started this whole auction off. The light turned on to me. Before I could say anything, my wife shouted, $50,000, the auctioneer commented. There you have it. $50,000, that man's generous support is what this foundation is all about. People clapped, nobody upbid me, and I just smiled and sipped some champagne. We ended up winning that statue, which I was pleased with. However, the conversation at the table rapidly changed. Oliva now looked at us with the most lustful eyes. A real estate agent can give someone in the market that is buying an expensive house. So, about that house in Pleasantville, do you have a card on you? My wife, without thinking, and in hindsight, mistakenly handed over one of my business cards. Here, this has all his contact info on it. I mean, throughout the night, she probably gave out 50 cards or so that evening and just instinctively gave Oliva a card. Great, thanks, Oliva said, with the largest fake smile anyone can give. Oliva looked classic fake North Texas. Big blonde hair, big fake boobs, blue eyes, a tan that made her look 10 years older than she should in plastic surgery that made her look 10 years younger than she was. That is to say, she was attractive, but you just can't figure out what seems off about her appearance. We left that night and a few weeks rolled by and I forgot much about Oliva altogether. We made a few connections that night and I was in the process of wrapping up a seven-figure deal when I got a call. This is Charles, I said. Hi, Charles, this is Oliva from the auction. Oh, hi, Oliva. Yes, I remember you. The real estate agent, right? Yes, I just wanted to touch base and see if I could show you some properties in Pleasantville. My wife and I were in the process of deciding whether to build the house or buy in Pleasantville. So I thought it might be a good idea to tour some homes, take lots of photos, and discuss it with my wife when she got back into town. See, my wife is a doctor, but primarily works for charities that need doctors willing to work in foreign countries or in extremely rural areas for three to four months at a time. As such, my wife was gone in the field. Sure, I'm free this Saturday. Great, I'll put you on my calendar, Oliva replied. So I met with Oliva on Saturday to tour some houses. They were really nice places, seven bedrooms, 12 bathrooms, two kitchens, and tons of land. These places are truly amazing, I told Oliva. I knew you would love it here. This place is perfect for you and your wife. Where is she, by the way? Oh, she's in Peru on a field assignment, I told her. Oh, how long will she be gone? She won't be back for another month. Now, I've been married for 12 years. I have become oblivious to when women are hitting on me, so I thought this was all just friendly small talk. You know, if you ever want to get dinner to talk about living in Pleasantville, let me know. I'll be happy to come over and cook for you while we discuss it. Okay. I'm thick, but not fucking stupid. Who comes over to cook a man dinner when his wife is away? No thanks, I politely declined. I'll send these photos to my wife and let you know what we decide. Oliva was a little frustrated at this point, I could tell. But she just nodded, smiled, and said, I understand, just let me know. Later that night, I got a phone call. It was from a number I didn't recognize. 
that isn't too uncommon, as my job makes connections with people that I don't know. This is Charles, I answered. Hey, Charles, it's Oliva. Why was this woman calling me after I had just spoken to her just earlier that day? Yes, I answered, puzzled. Listen, earlier today I just, well, I'm not sure how to put this. No guy has ever said no to me cooking them dinner to talk. I'm just not sure why you said no. Well, no offense, but I'm married, and it came off a little weird. Not sure my wife would approve. Oh, you got me all wrong, silly. I'm married too. I just try to give my clients that extra special touch to help the home buying process go much smoother. In some twisted way, that did make sense. I guess if you're selling high-end real estate, clients probably prefer special treatment. I see. Well, listen, my wife and I are self-made. We are not accustomed to the high-end treatment. We were not born into it, and so I apologize if I took your offer in a manner you didn't intend, I explained. Oh, well, it's perfectly normal to discuss business over dinner, and I make one hell of a roasted lamb. Well, I'm still uncomfortable, but I offered. How about we go to Avanti? We can discuss business over dinner there. Fine, she said shortly. I'll see you tomorrow at 7, she said before hanging up. I hadn't even agreed to meet yet. Dinner started off normal. Pleasantville has one of the greatest school districts in the nation. Many students end up attending Ivy League universities and becoming real power players, she explained. We are looking to have kids. I'm just not sure I want them growing up, not exposed to kids from poverty, etc. I think growing up with a global perspective is what made me the man I am today, I explained. She reached over, touched my jacket while saying, Oh, looks like your lap is twisted. Let me fix that for you. Next, I felt her hand sliding up my leg. I grabbed her hand and firmly pulled her hand off me. Listen, I think you might have had too much to drink. I suppose we should call it an evening. I asked for the check, paid the bill, and we both sat in awkward silence. While we were waiting for our cars to be brought forward, her car came first. As she walked to get into her car, she leaned over into my ear and whispered, Nobody tells me no. I always get what I want, Charles. And right now, I want you. She got into her car and drove off. A few weeks later, I was picking my wife up at the airport. As I opened her door and put her bags in the trunk, I closed the trunk and saw Oliva standing at my wife's window talking to her. Oliva waved at me and walked down into the airport. What the hell was she doing here, I thought to myself. I got into the car to drive, and my wife looked pissed. What the fuck were you doing out at dinner with Oliva? She started. Now, my wife is usually polite and lovely, and we never argue. Well, she asked me to dinner to talk about living in Pleasantville. That was a compromise. She originally offered to come to our house to cook, and I declined. I explained. Funny, she said, you were trying to get her to come over and she offered to go to dinner at a restaurant. My wife explained, luckily because I'm in a business where what people say can mean the difference between closing a million dollar deal or not, my phone has an app that automatically records all my phone calls. This is legal in my state. I played back Oliva's conversation with me and thankfully my wife believed me. We will not be doing business with that woman, my wife said. But still, Oliva was there trying to cause trouble with my wife. That evening, I was taking a shower when I started to hear my phone's notification that I received text messages. It kept going off, like a series of 15 messages in a row. What the hell's going on? Was there a crisis at work? It was 10.45 in the evening, but sometimes issues come up because our clients are half a world away. I heard my wife say, What in the ever-loving fuck? What is it, darling? I said, This fucking bitch is sending you the nudes you begged her for. My wife only uses foul language when she's really pissed off. Honey, I hope you know I never asked her to send me naked pictures. I know, but I don't like this. I don't like her knowing your number. I agreed to have her blocked. It wasn't like I could just change numbers. 
90% of my business is done over the phone with people who only have my phone number on a business card. I hand it out at some random point in time. By this time, it was clear that Aliwa was trying to cause real problems between me and my wife, and so far it was somewhat working. My wife wasn't upset with me, but we were both just really pissed off about the situation. I wish I could say it ended at blocking her phone call, but that is where the real trouble started. After, I started seeing Oliva jogging in my neighborhood, though she lived like five miles away. I don't even know how she found out where I lived. I never gave her my home address, and we lived in one of those gated communities with a security guard that signs people in and out. I have no clue how this woman was just casually jogging in our neighborhood. She would just wave and continue her run. And one morning, I heard a knock at the door. Who is it? I asked. It's the FBI. We have a warrant to search your home. I'm sorry, you must clearly be at the wrong address. I stated, confused. No, this is the right house. Now open the door or we will open it for you. Okay, officer. Let's just calm down and we can clear up this confusion. I opened the door. Can I see the warrant, please? The agent, Agent Banks, handed me a warrant and people headed inside. The warrant stated that through an anonymous tip, my company was trafficking humans for the sex trade through our international dealings and that I had evidence of the transactions on my home computer along with child porn involving the victims. This is fucking absurd, I thought, but I was also scared. This whole vindictive thing with Oliva was already affecting my personal life and now she was going after the reputation of my company. Agent Banks, you can take all you want. Look anywhere you want. I have nothing to hide. But I'll tell you this, if the tip came from a woman named Oliva Rogers, let me explain to you what has been going on. I then began to explain everything. After seizing everything and going through my home computers and those at the office, the FBI, not surprisingly, found nothing. The FBI said they could not prove it was Oliva that made the anonymous tip, but I was placed on some kind of watch list, not a bad one, one that went something like, Hey, if someone makes a complaint against Charles or his company, follow up on who is making the complaint. The FBI takes filing false complaints very seriously. After this ordeal, we hoped Oliva would stop all the nonsense and leave us alone. But that whisper kept playing in my mind. I always get what I want. Things settled down considerably after the whole FBI raiding my house. Aside from a broken lamp, I'm still trying to be reimbursed for. I thought maybe Oliva had moved on because it must have been three or four months since I saw her or heard from her. You might ask, why didn't I retaliate against her company? Well, I have moral and didn't want to risk trying to ruin her relationship and business simply because she was a complete and utter bitch. So after four months of my wife... Being home and living a somewhat normal life, it seemed like things had finally returned to normal. That being said, as a precaution, I had a surveillance system installed at my house. I also upgraded my security system, honestly because I thought the new system was pretty fancy. If you open the front door, the system would chime, beep, 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 front door. If it was the balcony door upstairs to the master bedroom, it would beep and chime, balcony door. My wife had an assignment come up in Mexico just for two months, but in any event, I was a little wary about her being gone. More so because while Oliva hadn't really directed her anger towards my wife, someone that unstable was capable of anything. I told my wife to bring a gun with her. Don't be silly. Besides, I'm not sure Mexico would allow me to enter the country with a gun. Baby, trust me, the police are just fine. Not nearly as corrupt as the media makes them out to be. I was a little uneasy, but she's a professional with a job to do. I dropped her off at the airport, kissed her, and said goodbye, putting on a brave face while trying not to let her see how uneasy I felt. It will only be for two months this time, she said. I'll be back before you know it. Okay, just be careful, and don't trust anyone you don't already know. I love you, come home safe, I said. Love you too. With that, she headed off into the dehumanizing maze which is TSA security. I headed home, deciding first to stop at the park along the way, 
It had been some time since I had really enjoyed the outside. I spent about half an hour or so just watching the birds on the lake and headed back to my house. As I drove up the driveway of my home, I noticed something on the front porch. It was a small object that I couldn't really make out what the shape or size of it was, other than that it was small. I parked right there in the driveway and headed towards the front porch. As I approached the front door, I started to notice what the object was. It was a small red gift box tied with a bow. At first, I kind of just thought, hmm, this is strange. But given that my wife had just left that day, I thought it might have been a farewell gift left by one of the neighbors. That was common as many people in the neighborhood appreciated the sacrifices she made. I picked up the gift, got back into my car, and parked the car. I sat the gift down on the counter. There was a far more pressing matter than opening a gift from my wife. The cowboy was were in the playoffs and the game was about to start. I cracked open the beer, made some nachos, and turned on the game. I thought the game would be long over before I could expect to hear from my wife. It was a good six-hour flight to where she was headed. I know what you're thinking. You expected to find wine and scotch. Well, remember, I grew up lower middle class. Where I came from, you cracked open a beer, made some nachos, and watched the game when your team was in the playoffs. When it was halftime, I headed back to the kitchen to see what other late night snacks I could grab before the second half of the game started. I turned around and spotted the gift box again. By this time, my curiosity was piqued and I decided to open it thinking, well, my wife might like to know she's appreciated when I talk to her later this evening. As I untied the box and lifted the lid, I couldn't help but feel how absolutely light it was. It was a small gift box, but I expected some weight to it. This felt like an empty box. I opened the box, and all there was inside was a little scrap of paper, much like what you would find in a fortune cookie. I picked up the piece of paper and the only thing on it was a smiley face. No shit. Wrapped up in that box was a piece of paper with a printed smiley face on it. What the hell is this? I thought to myself. Suspecting Oliva might have something to do with it, I decided to review the security footage. I scrolled the video back to where we left for the airport. The camera clearly showed the area near the front door. I fast forwarded, no box appeared for the first couple of hours. Then the video went out. It got really fuzzy for about 10 seconds and then it cleared back up and the gift was sitting there. Like it fucking appeared on the porch in the 10 seconds that the video was scrambled. What in the ever loving shit happened? I whispered to myself. I replayed the video probably a dozen times or so. Every time, no gift. Scramble, there's the gift. No matter how many times I played the video over and over, it just kept showing the same damn thing. No gift. Scrambled video, gift. I finally let it play on as I sat there puzzled. The next few seconds is what really fucking creeped me out. About 30 seconds after the gift appeared, I saw my car pull up. Did I miss seeing someone as I pulled up? Clearly, I would have seen someone in that close proximity of time to the gift appearing, I mumbled to myself. My mind raced as to what could be going on. At this point, I should probably mention that I spent 10 years in the 1st Reconnaissance Battalion with the United States Marine Corps. I do not scare easy, and I'm used to being in high-tense conflict situations. I injured my knee and ended up starting the firm that I'm with now. So my rational mind started to kick in. Okay, Charles, clearly the glitch lasts for more than a few seconds. And there must be some faulty equipment somewhere. I closed the video and chalked the whole thing up to just some kind of prank by Oliva. Who knows? Maybe in a twisted way this was some kind of peace offering? In any event, I threw the box in the trash and went to finish the rest of the game. I was sitting there on the couch for about an hour and all of a sudden... I heard something that immediately triggered me to go back into pure combat mode. Beep, beep, beep. Balcony door. The alarm chimed. Okay, some fucker just entered my house through my second story balcony door. I was the only one home 
says my wife was off flying to another country. And since I never heard another security chime, other than when I came in, one of two possibilities existed. One, someone entered my house before I got home, then hid out on the balcony. Or two, someone climbed to my balcony, then opened the door. I figured it had to be the latter. First, the alarm was set before I got home, so if someone came in while I was gone, the alarm would have physically sounded. Second, I typically do not set the alarm until I go to sleep. Third, I rarely lock the balcony door. We have high ceilings. The second story balcony is 15 feet above the ground and we live in a gated community. This means someone somehow scaled the 15 foot distance between the backyard and the base of the balcony, climbed over the balcony railing and entered through the balcony door. My training set in. I headed straight for the gun cabinet, unlocked it, and grabbed my Mossberg pistol grip shotgun. Frankly, in any home defense scenario, the most confident, never miss weapon I recommend is the Mossberg. I began to clear the downstairs rooms. While I know someone entered through the balcony, I wanted to rule out other people hiding downstairs. I also set the alarm to the house. Moving from room to room, I made sure to close all doors behind me. Okay, downstairs was clear. Time to face the real danger. I had no idea who had come in through the balcony, but either they or I was about to have a seriously bad day. I started to creep up the stairs, trying to walk as quietly as I could. Unfortunately, if I put too much stress on my left knee for too long, I got real sharp pains. I bit my teeth. Come on, Charles, get with it, I muttered to myself. I reached the top of the stairs, and as I turned the corner, nothing. Hmm. I got quiet. Whoever it was, they must have gone into one of the rooms. I started with the room furthest from the balcony door. After securing each room, I closed the door behind me. This made it easy for me to remember which rooms had been searched and also provided the intruder with a barrier to entry and hopefully forced them out in the open. Not that I locked the door, but I'll likely hear a door open or close unless the person is very careful. I finally had only one bedroom left to search, the master bedroom, and connected with it the bathroom. I had it in. I thoroughly searched the entire room under the bed, even looking in the drawers. I mean, hey, maybe it was a contortionist for all I know, but seriously. I wanted to be thorough. I head into the master bath and nothing. What the fucking hell, I thought to myself. I breathed a sigh of relief. Okay. Clearly, this is a defective security system. I'll call a company first thing in the morning, I thought angrily to myself. I sat for a moment, just catching my breath after an intense controlled breathing situation. My somewhat meditation was interrupted by beep, 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 front door, followed by the blast of the home alarm system going off. I grabbed my ears for a moment. Jesus, I didn't know it would be this loud. I regained my control and rushed towards the stairs and down to the first floor. The front door stood open. I looked outside, but I saw nobody. I headed back in, and then I noticed something even stranger. Every single door, not just this door, but I'm talking every cabinet door in the kitchen, every door to every room, every closet door in every room were open. I got the fuck out of there, opting to snap a few photos with my phone before heading to a hotel and calling the police on the way. Sitting in my hotel room, I was frantically waiting for my wife to call. At the same time, I was trying to figure out what the hell had happened. I knew Oliva had to be connected somehow. Perhaps she hired some group to terrorize me, I wondered. But how could she move so fast? I thought, I mean, I could understand escaping me, but opening all the doors? I started to remember, when your adrenaline is pumping in an intense situation, people's perception of time gets all jacked up. Frankly, I could have been outside for 10 minutes trying to catch a glimpse of whoever had just run outside, but I just thought it was only a few seconds. 
My thoughts were interrupted by my cell phone ringing. Baby, I said, did you make it there okay? How was the flight? I heard a female voice laugh. Calling me baby now, I see. It was Oliva. Well, I won't tell if you won't, she whispered. I was in the area and thought I might stop by. But you have that pesky security guard. Would you be a doll and let me in? She whispered in a half laughing voice. I'm not home at the moment. In fact, I'm out on business for a while, I told her. That's a pity, she said. I have a gift. I was hoping to drop it off for you. But I guess I'll wait. How is your wife? I take it by your answer earlier that you haven't heard from her. I do hope nothing happened to her, she said in a seductive tone. The rage I felt at that point, well, but at the end I had nothing. Nothing to suggest that anything had happened to my wife. I had just had an intense evening and I was letting this bitch get to me. I calmed myself and responded in a stoic tone. I'm sure she's fine. My wife is the most amazing woman I know. I, she interrupted. For now it is. Excuse me, I responded. She's the most amazing woman you know, for now that is. Once you get to know me, I'm sure you'll find just how um, amazing I can be. Look, Oliva, my wife and I are very happy together. I would really appreciate it if you would respect that. Now, if you'll excuse me, I think I'm going to turn in for the night. She laughed. I told you, I always get what I want. You cannot deny me, Charles, and in the end, I always get what I want. She hung up. Okay, I was legitimately worried about my wife at this point. She should have landed over an hour ago, and she usually called right as she landed. I tried calling her cell. No answer. Hmm. If she had already left the airport, she might not have cell reception as parts of rural Mexico tend not to have any cell towers for her phone to connect to. I decided to try her one more time on the sat phone. This was supposed to be my reserved for emergency communication phone, but fuck it. This constituted an emergency in my book. I called it. It rang and rang and rang. Hello? It was my wife. Baby, what happened? I was worried. You usually call when you land. I did call. I called the house phone, but don't you remember? What do you mean? I called you, you answered. Are you feeling better? Earlier you said you were feeling sick and your voice was horrid. Honestly, I thought you were acting really strange and was worried about you. I thought about calling the neighbors to check on you, but figured you just had too much to drink. What do you mean, more? I mean, I never spoke to you. In fact, I wasn't home an hour ago. By the way, someone broke into our house. I'm in a hotel waiting for the police to come to take a statement right now. At this point, all I heard was total silence. Clearly, someone was still in our house. If my wife just spoke to them on the phone, some fucker impersonated me. This was getting completely out of control. Finally, my wife softly said, well, who, if it wasn't you, who, who did I speak to? I don't know, but I'm about to find out. No, just wait for the police, she said. Listen, did you tell them anything important like where you were at for the month? I can hear her start to breathe a little heavier. Not the specifics. I thought you were drunk and wouldn't remember, so I just told you I was in a small village about 100 miles from Monterey. Okay, at least I knew that whoever was on the phone with my wife didn't know exactly where she was. Look, baby, just get some rest. I'll take care of things here. You just focus on your patience. I told her, I'm a little worried, she said. If you want, go ahead and come on home. It might be safer. No, 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 these people are really sick. I'll try to come home early, but I need at least to care for most of the ones that are at risk. Okay. But check in every day at 9 p.m. Central Time. All right, I love you, she said. Love you too. Good night. With that, I heard a knock on my door, and I jumped a little, still on edge. Mr. Sullivan, it's Detective Hernandez. One moment. I'll be right there. I grabbed my coat and opened the door. 
Hi, Detective Fernandez. Can I see a badge? He showed it to me. Okay, I think we should head back to my house. I just spoke to my wife, and apparently someone was there and answered the phone. Wait, wait, wait. You think someone is still at your house? Yes, apparently someone was there and spoke to my wife on the home phone. I'm pretty sure nobody's there. We sent an officer to check it out about an hour ago. He said he didn't see anyone around. Detective, my wife said she spoke to someone an hour ago. That person impersonated me on the phone to my wife. If it was one of your officers, so help you God. Wait, hold on. Let me see who went to your house and we can call them in and sort this whole matter out. I'm sure none of my officers would impersonate someone. That is, that is, we just wouldn't do that. Okay, detective, I have a security system at my house. We can see if your officer answered my phone. We headed back to my house and the detective entered first and did a full sweep of the house. I don't know if this was proper or not, but I had a feeling he didn't believe anything actually happened. I then headed in and immediately pulled up the video. Sure enough, you see a police officer walking around the house. He closed all the doors, the drawers, and you could clearly see him answer the phone. Look, detective, I swear, I want the name of that officer right fucking now. He's even covering up evidence of the crime. The detective immediately radioed dispatch. Who was the officer that investigated the Sullivan's house earlier this evening? I'm sorry, sir. I don't show any officers being dispatched to that location. What do you mean? I ordered an officer to check out the Sullivan's home after we received the house alarm. I'm sorry, sir, but nobody was dispatched. There is no record of your order or that an officer was dispatched. That's impossible. The detective was clearly upset. I got a call. I think his name was Murphy. Officer Murphy. Is that it? He told me that the house was clear. I'm sorry, sir. We do not have an Officer Murphy or anyone named Murphy for that matter. The detective and I looked at one another. The video clearly showed a cop walking through the house and talking on the phone, but the official police records of the incident did not exist. Thank you. I'll be right in, Detective Fernandez replied. Mr. Sullivan, I apologize. It seems now we have someone impersonating an officer. Trust me, I will get to the bottom of this in very short order. The detective left and headed back to the station, carrying the surveillance camera's hard drive with him as he left. Then he turned to me and said, Mr. Sullivan, as a precaution, I recommend you stay at a hotel until we sort this whole thing out. I told him that I would, but I just wanted to grab some other clothes. He agreed to wait. I headed towards the master bedroom to pack a suitcase. First, I grabbed my go bag a habit I have had since my marine days. I always kept a survival bag in the closet in case I ever needed to just get out. It had your standard food for a few days, water, ways to make fire, ways to purify water, but importantly, it also had my trusted HK UPS and some other goodies I had uh, borrowed from my days as a recon marine. I started to pack my suitcase, grab suits for the week and all the essentials I needed and as I finished packing, I headed back down the stairs, but something caught my eye as I walked down the stairs. There at the base step was another red box. Detective, did you see anyone come in? I cried out. No, I've been standing here this whole time at the door. Now hurry, I got a lot of work to do. I headed down the stairs and picked up the box, unwrapped it, opened it, and there again, a small scrap of paper. I looked at it, and all it said was, I always get what I want. Fucking Oliva, I muttered to myself. What's that? The detective asked. Nothing. I'm just reminding myself of some things. With that, I tucked the box into my jacket pocket and headed out to the hotel. Once I got to the hotel and I kind of just laid back and started to think about what happened, I realized that I needed to change my tactics. Somebody was trying to get into my head by trying to get into my house. And what was worse is this wasn't a prank. I believed that not only I was in danger, but my wife was in danger. And I knew deep down inside 
that everything had to do with Oliva. At this point, I realized she had run me out from my house. What was I going to do about it? Well, there was only one thing to do about it. I had to get back to basics. After I got a few hours of shut-eye, I decided to take a few days off and I rearranged appointments, rerouted some of my calls, and decided that I was going to be the one to lay the trap for whoever it was that was stalking and going into my home, my castle. So I went and I bought some black jeans, black t-shirts, real nondescript clothing, all my suits that I had taken with me just hung in the hotel closet and I decided just to reconnoiter on my property. But then the first thing I decided was I'm going to test this theory just to see. I had a hunch about it and I wanted to make sure. The following day I drove over to the house like I usually did. Very open, my usual stuff. And sure enough when I drove off I pretended I was going shopping. I knew I felt that somebody was following me and sure enough I realized that about three cars back there was a strange automobile that kept pace with me and I took two or three weird turns and they stayed behind me. I then went made some several stops like at the cleaners, I went to the drugstore and I realized it was the same car. It was a yellow Volvo with tinted windows. I didn't recognize it but at the same time there aren't that many yellow Volvos. So check off number one. I was being followed. Something was going on. I wasn't sure it was Oliva but I felt tempted to say that if it wasn't her it was somebody she had sent. So the next day I put plan number two into effect. I decided to go ahead rent a different car and reconnoiter and start looking at my house just to see if I caught somebody going in there. I did this for about three days. It was pretty boring. I had also bought a pair of really good binoculars and I listened to some podcasts while I watched my house from a small hill in a park that was in the middle of the development where I basically had a very clear view of what was going on on my property. I walked around. Most of the guards knew who I was so I didn't raise any eyebrows. Then on the third night that's when I hit pay dirt. I was there just watching the house. The sun was starting to go down. It was almost nighttime when I saw a shadow lurk around the bushes that divided my yard from my neighbors. I heard their dog barking and I knew that little dog, it would only bark when something was off. And I kept watching and I saw somebody dressed in dark clothing just lurk in the shadows of the bushes and then just kept going along into the shadows. Whoever this was, they really knew what they were doing because they made sure that even though night was falling, they never stepped out to where the light from the lamppost would expose them. They kept into the shadows and finally I saw them go into the back portion of the yard. And then incredibly I saw this person throw a rope up and very nimbly climb up to the balcony that I had heard that first time when the alarm went off. I looked at this and wondered what the fuck is going on. I couldn't tell from the distance if this was a woman or a man. The person seemed very agile, but I still couldn't make out who it was. I saw them land on the balcony and apparently they carried some type of tools because before I knew it, I saw the sliding glass door open up. This was a real eye opener in more than one way. And just to let you know, all these nights I had been speaking to my wife from Mexico. We kept our appointment every night at 9 p.m. and we spoke on the phone. She was okay and I tried to pretend I was okay but I think that she kind of sensed that I was a little bit upset that something was worrying me but I reassured her that I was staying at the hotel. I never let on about what I was really doing with my time because 
I knew it would just worry her and what could she do? She was in another country. All I knew was that I had to resolve this problem one way or the other before she got back. We could not continue to live like this. And obviously, the police were not going to be any help. Somebody had given them a turn and they had not been aware of it. That was why I realized it was up to me to figure this problem out and take care of it. Yep, that was the Marine in me thinking up that last one. So I watched this person going through the balcony and I started to wonder if they knew I wasn't there or they did or what was what, what were they trying to do, this person that had gone in there. And then I had this thought, what if they were planting something inside my house? I thought of when the FBI had knocked on my door and I was accused of human trafficking. And the only thing that got me off the hook was when they didn't find anything anywhere, much less on my computer. But I remembered that yes, I had my laptop, but I also had a desktop computer that I used for a lot of my business affairs. It was inside an office that I kept there in the house. What if this person was going in there trying to sabotage or worse, put in some false information where the next time I had some law enforcement agency knocking on my door and I was being accused of something, they would find evidence. What if it wasn't me? What about my wife? My wife had a lot of her documentation as a doctor also in her own office. And then I even thought of all the prescriptions she wrote out. What if somebody went ahead and put something in there that would destroy her medical career. My thoughts kept going round and round on all the possibilities of things that could be done to us. We had been so innocent because we wanted to live our lives, have fun. And since we never bothered anybody, we always felt safe that nobody could do anything to us. And look what had happened after crossing paths with the wrong person. There was just something off about Oliva. Initially, you would just think of her as just a crazy stalker. God knows there's a lot of those around and everybody's heard stories about stalker girlfriends, stalker boyfriends, but there was just something really worse about this lady the more I thought about it. So I sat there and it was like torture because I really wanted to see if possibly this person would leave behind some fingerprints I wanted to see how long they would be in there. And I wanted to see how they planned to get out of my house. I had to have the upper hand in this situation. I had to turn the tables on whoever was doing this to my life, my career, my future. Whoever it was, wasn't in there long. Maybe 15 minutes later, I saw that same figure come back out, close the window on the balcony, and then just shimmy down the rope and unhook it and they left the same way they got there. I told myself I'm going to watch this place again tomorrow. I needed to find out if this was going to happen again. I slept that night really bad. I tossed and turned and every time I dozed I had these nightmare scenarios playing out in my head. I even woke up a few times thinking that there was somebody standing next to me in the bed. And when I spoke to my wife, I could tell that she was worried about me. She asked me if she wanted me to come home. And part of me wanted to tell her, yes, come back. Not because I'm afraid, but because if I have you here, I can take care of you. I can make sure you're okay. But I didn't say anything. The more I thought about it, the more I realized I needed to keep her away from here, especially now. The next day was a long day. And now that I realized that whoever was going in there was doing it towards the evening, I tried to get some sleep during the day and finally caught a few hours of shut-eye. Then, towards the end of the day, I got ready and I decided this time, this time, I wasn't just going to watch from a hill. So I went back to my position, again in the rental car, and of course I always made sure that I wasn't being followed. I wasn't stupid enough to assume that just because I was using a rental car and dressed differently 
that had shaken the tail that had been following me the other time. But I didn't see the yellow Volvo, and I didn't see any car that was acting suspiciously. I went up there behind some bushes, my usual location, with my binoculars, and stared and looked. And this time, I did see where that yellow Volvo I saw when it came in and parked about a few blocks from where my house was at. But it was a clear line of sight, and that was an area that was usually left for some visitor parking. I watched, and then I saw the person exit, and I saw the person try to walk normally. And now that I knew what I was looking for, I saw that it was indeed Oliva, dressed in some dark pants and a dark long sleeve shirt. And then when she was getting close to the house, the sun was almost down. It was dark. She ducked behind something and the next thing I knew she had put on what I had seen her with the day before. A ski mask, gloves. At that point, it was really hard to tell that it was a man or a woman. And she made the same route. She walked the same route, keeping into the shadows. Again, I heard my neighbor's stupid little dog barking and that's when I moved. I went in there and I slowly weighed my way between some trees and a walking path that ran about two properties from where my house stood. I did the same thing she did. I kept to the shadows, stayed in the pockets of darkness just to make sure she didn't spot me. And then I set my trap. Because see, I had made sure that when I set the alarm, I had went ahead and I left the back door free from the alarm. I bypassed that one door so that I would be able to gain entrance to my own home without setting off the alarm. And that's what I did. I slowly walked in the shadows, walked up to the back door and slowly eased the door open. I knew my way around my house and I stayed there in the laundry room, which is where this door brought me into the house. I stood there just listening, listening to the silence. And now that I knew what I was listening for, I heard that movement of somebody walking upstairs. And I could tell that that person was going to come downstairs. I heard the step on the stairs, very slight, but Apparently, she realized that nobody or she thought nobody was in the house and felt a little bit more at liberty to make noises. So, I hear her coming down the stairs. She came in and I could hear that she would pause every once in a while, though, to still look around and do what I was doing. But I stayed in the shadowed laundry room. The door to it was open. and I could look into the kitchen area, and a small dining room or breakfast nook place. And that's when I saw her. I saw her walk in. And I saw she had like a small bottle in her hand. I saw her go to the refrigerator, open up the refrigerator and pull out a tall jar of apple juice that we kept there. It happened that that was the juice that both me and my wife enjoyed. So we usually had a full jar of it in the refrigerator. I saw her pour in half of what was in that little vial into the juice. And whatever it was was colorless because it dissolved. You could not tell that anything had been poured into the apple juice. I felt my gut wrench think, why was she doing this? Was she trying to poison us? Was she trying to knock us out? Was she just trying to make me sick? I knew this lady was dangerous, but then and there really hit me just what a whack job she was. Part of me wanted to rush out and just grab her by the neck and throw her against the wall. But a part of me told me, wait, be patient, watch her. If she's as dangerous as you think, you need to find out exactly if there's anything else she's done or even worse is planning to do. Then I heard her go to the pantry and rummage around in some of the canned goods. I think she was trying to find something that she could put 
the rest of what was in that bottle into. But everything in the pantry, in the cupboards, was sealed. It was a, it was canned. There was nothing for her to use it on. And I saw her stick the vial back in a pocket in her pants. Then I saw her just stand there in the kitchen, just looking at everything, wanting to. It was a weird feeling, but it was almost like she was seeing herself like this was her kitchen, not our kitchen. And I realized, I kind of realized then what she meant when she said that nobody ever told her no. I think the problem was that she never finished that sentence, which was nobody ever tells me no, because if they do, I get rid of them. Was she a psychopath, a sociopath? a looney tune. I saw her leave and run up the stairs. I could hear her. But then at the top, I heard her turn and go towards the bedroom where I kept my office stuff, my desktop. And I knew right then and there that my hunch had been on the money. This lady was going to tamper with my business records or do something. It was probably going to be like a a sleeper bomb. If I played and went along with her plans, nothing would happen. But if I ever told her no or blew her off like I had done before, or worse, call the police on her, God knows she already knew that she had set that trap up for me. And then she would just spring it and bring my world crashing down on our heads. I knew right then and there that I couldn't let her leave the house without knowing what she was about. God only knows what she was going to do, what she had done, and what if she didn't come back to the house now for months? How would I ever prove that she was the one that had actually broken into my house? So I quickly made my way through the kitchen, the dining room, I came to the foot of the stairs and I waited there for a moment. I could tell she was still in there. I quietly made my way up the stairs, stopping every few steps just to listen. I had almost reached the top of the stairs when I heard her exiting my office and head towards the bedroom with the balcony. I stayed in the shadows of an alcove and I watched her walk right past me. And then I followed her into the room. And as she was pulling the sliding door open, I said, So, Livia, what a surprise. What are you doing in my house? She turned around. Her eyes widened up. And for a split second, I saw fear. But then all of a sudden, she got this really weird look on her face. She smiled, put her hands on her hips, and just said, So, darling, how are you doing? Long time no see. What do you mean, what am I doing in your house? Don't you mean our house? Because you know that not too long from now, you and me, we're going to be living happily ever after. And I decided I, this, this is okay for us now, temporarily even though eventually I think we should move into something bigger, more spacious. You know, I'll find a place for us. Don't you worry about it. I looked at her. In reality, I stared at her, thinking, okay, this is a real nut job, a for real nut job, not a pretend one. I said, Oliva, in case you uh, forgot about uh, the obvious, you're married and I'm married, plus, I have no interest in you. And I could see she clenched her teeth even though she kept trying to keep that smile and paste it on her face. Oh, your wife, my husband, those are things that don't matter. We can get rid of them. There's divorce, there's separation. I mean, there's a lot of things, you know, even more permanent than that. Just say the word, sweetheart. I will clear the decks. I mean, as far as my husband's concerned, I can... I'll snap my fingers and I'll send them on his way. I mean, let's face it. There's more than one way to skin a cat. And your wife, well, I mean, anything could happen. I mean, you could just divorce her or 
You know, she could be traveling in one of these places she goes off to. God knows. And uh, maybe her bus falls off the side of a cliff, right? I mean, accidents do happen. I looked at her. And I don't know, she mistook my silence for, I don't know what, agreement. So I realized that this lady was fucked in the head. And I decided at that moment just to choose my words wisely. Okay, Oliva, let's get something straight. I'm not going to get rid of my wife. I love my wife. I don't care what you do with your husband. That's your problem. No, no, that's his problem. But... I want you out of my house, out of my life. You know what? I've got you filmed, which was a lie. Breaking into my house. And I know you've done something in here. By the way, I saw what you put in that juice in the refrigerator. I'm planning to remove it and have it tested. As a matter of fact, I know you got half of whatever you put in there in a little vial in your pocket. You know what? The more I think about it, maybe we should just call the police right now. I saw her mouth become tight and strained and the look in her eyes changed she was trying to smile but all of a sudden the way she was looking at me wow the way she was looking at me you know that saying about thin line between love and hate well i could tell i was on the hate side of that line right then and there but i could tell she was sizing up for one more try or was she Oh, come on, Charles. You don't have to play hard to get with me anymore. You got me. You know, what? what's that movie? You got me at Hello or something like that? Well, you've got me, darling. You don't have to play hard to get. All right, I know you're kind of sentimental. You know, we could just, I mean, I was kidding about getting rid of spouses the hard way. I mean, what do you think the divorces are for divorce courts I mean I, I do know really what I meant was I mean I know some judges that can just hurry a divorce through really quick really really quick okay I mean that's really what I meant and I mean I we could you know just as a matter of fact we could just fast track divorce proceedings and before you know it it's a done deal you know, it's incredible when you know the pe right know the right people and pull the right strings and things like that, and and then you'll see. You, know, you just don't understand how much happier you could be with somebody like me. And I think also that you're you've been leading like this really boring life. And when we get together, honey, I'm going to introduce you to this lifestyle that you will look back on this and go. What a dumbass I was. Believe me. Things are going to be so much better between you and me. And honey, you know that there's also something extra special that's going to happen between you and me. But it's my turn to play hard to get. I'll tell you what. What is that boring little housewife doctor person coming back? I'm sure she's not back for what, maybe a couple of weeks? What if I leave this? I'm, look at me. Look at how I'm dressed. This is not going to do. I'm going to leave. And what if we meet the same time, same place, tomorrow here, around the same time. But I'm going to come dressed up for an evening that you will never forget. What do you say, lover? And then, you know what? Maybe then we can make some other plans. Uh, but, you know, I, I just... I want to get, I'm a girl. I want, to, I want to look like nice for you. What do you say, sweetheart? I just looked at her and thought, man, I scratched my head. And I realized that this was going not going to play out the way I had imagined. If I at any point thought that by telling Oliva that I was going to call the cops, that she was just going to stand there and wait, boy, was I wrong. So I stood up close to her and leaned into her and I said Oliva you're not going anywhere you're going to stand right there and you're going to wait for the cops to arrive I don't want to be with you you fucking bitch are you out of your head and that's when she punched me right in my nose I had leaned right into it and man 
she jabbed me so quick and I felt the bones in my nose crunch. The bitch broke my nose. In one swift move, she headed towards the balcony. I'd grabbed my nose and then I sprinted after her. I couldn't let her get away because I knew then that I was never going to get this chance again to prove what she had done. I grabbed her by the back of the neck and she turned around and tried to knee me in my crotch. I couldn't believe the shit. With one hand, I was holding my nose and with the other one, I tried to put it over my crotch because this lady was going for the goods. And then I tried to grab her and she bit me. She bit me on the hand. I could, I screamed, I yelled. I was trying so hard not to punch her because I knew that that was not going to look good when the police arrived. I didn't know what else to do. She was trying to go down over that balcony and I could tell that once she hit the ground, she was out of there. And then all of a sudden, she did one of these weird jujitsu moves that even though I was leaning over her, she somehow slipped out from under me and then pushed me over and I found myself hanging on to the rails of that balcony, hanging for dear life. And she just stood there and looked down at me and she smiled and it was the coldest smile. And I looked at her eyes and they were like a shark's eyes. There was nothing there. Just, you know, when you see those documentaries that the shark's eyes turn up when they're going to feed. And I knew at that moment, this lady was going to feed on me. And it was just as well that I was so caught up trying to hang on to the bars of the balcony and looking at her that I didn't give away the person that approached her from the back because suddenly I saw an arm come around, grab her by the neck and plunge a syringe into her neck. I looked up and I was staring at my wife's face. She pushed the limp body of Oliva to the ground and grabbed my hand. It was really hard for her because the truth was I weighed a lot, more than she could ever pull up. But she kept me steady and helped me regain one of the upper bars and I was able to pull myself back onto the balcony. We both stood there and looked down at Oliva who lay at our feet totally doped up. My wife turned to me and whispered, I knew something was wrong. I knew something was up. That's why I decided after I hung up with you to take the next flight in. And I'm glad I did because I knew this lunatic was not going to leave us alone and you were keeping something from us. Make a long story short, we called the police. They came over. I explained to them what I had seen. They took samples of what was in the apple juice, which turned out to be some type of drug that was a hallucinogenic and possibly could have killed either one of us because of the portions she had put in there. They went into my computer, found some information had been placed in there with fraudulent banking transactions that could have been made to look like anything. In my wife's office, they found two pads of prescriptions had been removed. Some of them, which could have easily been forged and it would have been traced back to my wife, thus ruining her career. It was a few days later that one of the detectives assigned to the case came to see us. And what he told us left me and my wife just looking at him with our mouths hanging open. It turned out that Oliva belonged to a death cult slash bondage club. It turned out that her husband was really her slave and she was a dominatrix. She would supposedly marry these men 
and even though they appeared to be successful in truth, she was the one that ran the show. She would use them, be with them, and then get rid of them. In some cases, they were looking into some of her prior relationships. Some of them had been marriages where the men had just totally disappeared. Or otherwise, she had ruined them financially in a variety of ways. She was known for being, what was the word he used? A sadist. And that she had already, very early in her life, had charges pressed against her for being a stalker. The sad truth that she had a very abusive background and as a child had even been put into an insane asylum for trying to kill her parents. Well, needless to say, after that experience, even though we liked our home, me and my wife decided, just for our own sakes, our own peace of mind, that we definitely needed to move away. And it wasn't going to be to Pleasantville or, as a matter of fact, anywhere near there. And that's what we did. We sold the home. Luckily, we did it in quite a short time. And we got a pretty good proceed from that sale. And we were able to buy another house. As a matter of fact, we went across the country in a very secure, very secure development. And we were told that we would be advised if Oliva ever got parole or escaped or was released. Who knows? Because all she kept talking about during the time that she was held in prison was about me and my wife and that she was going to have her revenge because in the end, the end, of course, for her, who knows what that was, the devil was in the details.